I should start by explaining what the DSM is. So DSM stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, fifth edition. Uh, and it's published by the American Psychiatric Association. And sometimes people call it the Psychiatrist's Bible. You could also call it the Psychologist's Bible. What it really is is a listing of official names for mental disorders and detailed criteria for diagnosing them. And I think we've talked at our meetings before about the, you know, criteria are um, in, in nature, um, people have a diagnosis, have a condition or not, but it's really hard to tell. There's no easy blood test for all of these conditions. And so in order to cope with that, we sort of try to socially agree on criteria that have to be met. What's tricky about that is in reality, a lot of these diagnoses are probably on a gradient and shades of gray. And when you're making a diagnosis, you're forced to make a black and white decision about something that exists in nature on a gradient. So there are always difficult edge cases and difficult decisions to be made. And the DSM-5 is replacing the previous version, which was DSM-4-TR. And the criteria in Section 3 are really interesting to look at. In a way, what I think they function best at is they work really well as a good description of FASD. They're a great way to sort of explain it to people who haven't had a lot of experience with people with FASD. But they don't seem to play quite the same role as the Canadian diagnostic criteria that we are using or the diagnostic criteria from the University of Washington that we used before and that are still used in some states. And the reason is that they really are designed to be like most things in the DSM, which is that they're designed to be used primarily by a psychiatrist rather than a multidisciplinary team. And so they're not explicitly multidisciplinary. They don't talk a lot about test scores. They're not explicitly operationalized. So they don't talk about sort of, well, you need to test this with a direct test or not. They just talk about sort of descriptions. Um, if you think about the ADHD criteria, which are not related to tests, right? They're little descriptions and you count how many of the descriptions fit. These criteria are a lot more like that. They don't emphasize explicit numerical cutoff, so there's no sort of score has to be below here. And they also really downplay the role of physical features. I think not because they didn't think physical features were important, but that they thought they weren't psychiatrists' business. So really what they've designed with the DSM is a way for psychiatrists to look at people that were coming to them for other reasons and sort of say, oh, like alcohol might be something important here. They're really a way for psychiatrists to mark off parts of their population that deserve a different approach. So the, um, the, the term used in the DSM is neurodevelopmental disorder, again, um, with a hyphen, prenatal alcohol exposed. Neurodevelopmental alcohol neurodevelopmental disorder prenatal, with prenatal alcohol exposure. In general, what you have to have to get this research criteria in the DSM is you have to have exposure to alcohol, and then you have to have three functional criteria. So there's no facial features or growth anywhere. To meet their criteria, you have to have impaired neurocognitive functioning in at least one area. So think about learning things. I'll show you exactly how that's laid out in a minute. You have to have a learning problem. You have to have impaired self-regulation in at least one area. So we could call that behavior or emotion or something like that. So a learning problem, a behavior problem, and then you have to have impairment in adaptive functioning in at least two areas. And so you have to have some life skill problems probably related to the other two. So that kind of works, right? That kind of fits for a lot of the kids that we know with FASD. It does um, do a good job of describing the condition. It has to show up in childhood, so it doesn't have to be diagnosed in childhood, but if it's really FASD, the symptoms should have been there in childhood. It shouldn't be a person who was completely typical and then suddenly had these problems. There has to be clinically significant distress or impairment, like almost everything in the DSM, and it has to be not better explained by postnatal substance use, a general medical condition, another known teratogen, a genetic condition, or environmental neglect. And not better explained is, these are important words, because it's not saying you can't diagnose it if you have any of these other things. But those other things can't be the best explanation. So you have to think that those other things are incomplete as an explanation without including alcohol exposure. In practice, this is really difficult to know. Uh, so if we look at the DSM's um, summary of the functional criteria, again, for impaired neurocognitive functioning, they have... Uh, 
five possibilities. So you show impaired neurocognitive functioning by looking at a low IQ or a low developmental score on a Bailey, if you're talking about a young kid, by impairment in executive functioning, by impairment in learning, for example, a learning disability, by impairment in memory, and by impairment in visual spatial reasoning. So one of the things to notice here is they're struggling a bit with how, much, how operational it should be. So when it's IQ, we've got really um, clear rules about what the number has to be. But when it's memory impairment, you know, difficulty um, repeatedly making the same mistakes or difficulty remembering lengthy verbal instructions, it sort of sounds like that could be a psychiatrist's judgment, more of an interview question there. So there's a lot left open from that point of view. When we look at self-regulation, here I think they did a nice job of describing what their research has shown about uh, FASD in that they're looking for impairment in mood or behavioral regulation, attention deficit, and impairment in impulse control. And the first one, one of the things that science has shown us is that we really used to think that um, FASD affected your learning, it's hard to have poor learning, this makes you depressed or anxious or angry. Um, but in fact, these difficulties have not really been shown to be secondary based on the animal research. It looks like there's more of a primary route to problems with mood and behavior regulation. That is, the alcohol exposure does physically affect the development of the stress hormones in the brain. So the person actually is born, you know, even if their life experience was optimal, they are born with a tendency to be more angry or depressed or anxious, and that we really should think of that as a symptom of FASD rather than a consequence. Okay, and adaptive functioning, you're probably familiar with adaptive functioning from working in schools. This is our term for uh, practical activities of everyday living, um, including um, communication and social skills. And in some ways, this is a way of operationalizing that idea about is something disabling? Adaptive behavior is really about you know, is the person disabled in their everyday life? The DSM here just finds it in a little bit of a funny way in that they talk about communication here rather than in neurocognitive, which struck most people in the field as strange. Um, but it is the way some of the common adaptive behavior tests are structured. So they talk about impairment in communication, social communication, daily living skills, or motor skills. Again, motor skills, um, to many people seems more like a neurocognitive problem that is something that we can test, a skill problem that we can test directly rather than a functional problem that you would assess more in everyday environments. Um, you might also notice, if I back up here, that executive function is, is in two places. It's called executive function here in neurocognitive and it's called impulse control here in self-regulation. Most people think that impulse control is part of executive functioning, and so it's a little confusing to many psychologists that it's it described in both ways here. That also means, and maybe that's not a bad thing, given how important executive function is, that um, executive function gets you a long way towards this diagnosis, that if you have really serious problems in executive function, you need to have less other evidence of difficulties. Maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's a bad thing. On the one hand, executive functioning problems are really disabling. On the other hand, they're particularly tricky to assess. I think psychologists know the direct tests that we have don't work all that well. Um, we tend to use secondary assessments of parent and teacher reports, but those are also a bit of a struggle as they don't clearly tell the difference between sort of real executive function problems and other emotional distress kind of difficulties. So um, on the one hand, it makes sense as we think about these, the phenomenon of what it's like to be this kid or to live with this kid, but it's actually quite hard to put into practice. Um, a lot of people also responded to this criteria by thinking that, you know, there's not really enough language or communication skills in here for the FASD kids that we know, where we feel like that's a pretty prominent problem for a lot of the kids. So some of the strengths of these new criteria are, first of all, it does increase the visibility of FASD to have them in the DSM. Many people have felt um, upset by the fact that they weren't in there before. Um, the, um, structure, this idea of a learning problem and a behavior problem and an adaptive problem has been pretty well reviewed. In Canada, we have had, we've started calling it the super domains because when we're doing FASD diagnosis, we talk about our domains of brain function. You may have heard that, heard us talk about that before. In this case, they're talking about these three super domains of learning, behavior, 
adaptive behavior, and that does make sense to a lot of people. Uh, the weaknesses of these criteria really probably are that it doesn't really tell you how you do them in practice, that most of us who work in clinics really do feel like that in order to assess FASD properly, it's really hard. <laughs> we really struggle with it a lot of the time, and we feel like it is ideal to have a multidisciplinary team to do it. It mostly does de-emphasize formal assessment and makes it sound a lot like a psychiatrist sort of asking interview questions would be able to adequately assess the skills, and I'm not so convinced that's true. And there also aren't really clear sort of cutoff between, well, really, how disabled do you have to be? So it does seem that it would be applied more differently from clinic to clinic than some of the other alternatives for diagnosis. So this is where we're at with the DSM. It is a step forward in terms of visibility. It is getting more people talking about FASD, but I'm not aware of anyone who's using these criteria yet because of some of these difficulties. So it's not being used for research, and I'm not aware of anyone who's using it clinically. It may at times be used in psychiatry systems where they're looking at kids who uh, come primarily for mental health assessment from that point of view. So it's worth us all knowing about and reflecting on, but it's probably not something that's going to change our practice at this point in time. <laughs>